I'm John Riley, here with Bob Letterer, co-producers of Out FM. Today, we're presenting part one of a two-part series on an exciting new multimedia website of ACT UP's Oral History Project, available at actuporalhistory.org. It's an archive of 187 interviews with surviving members of the New York chapter of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, recorded between 2002 and 2017. The overall oral history project has been coordinated by Jim Hubbard and Sarah Schulman with principal camera work by James Wincy and contributions by others. The new website relaunch has been organized by Jim Hubbard. ACT UP, founded in March 1987, is a diverse nonpartisan group of individuals united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. At its height in the early 90s, ACT UP had some 150 chapters in cities around the world, largely in the global north. ACT UP's determined advocacy and highly focused demonstrations supported by innovative graphics utterly changed the world's perception of people with AIDS and queer people. This last description, found on the actuporalhistory.org website, introduces uh, uh, the, the viewers to some of the in-depth coverage of the accomplishments of one of the most effective and influential U.S. LGBTQ activist groups in recent decades. This site is a great source of political and tactical decisions that challenge government policy and inaction at a time when the U.S. HIV epidemic was killing hundreds of thousands and infecting more than a million young men and some women. It reveals some of the ways that the group was able to capture the attention of the mass media and communicate to the public at large about government and corporate failures that jeopardize so many uh, lives of people living with HIV and AIDS. As the website says, quote, the ACT UP movement, along with its allies, radically altered the medical research and drug approval process in the United States and the doctor-patient relationship while its four-year campaign to change the CDC definition of AIDS to include opportunistic infections affecting women and injection drug users saved millions of lives across the world. The Latina, Latino caucus fostered not only AIDS activism, but jump-started LGBT activism in Puerto Rico. Joining us to discuss the project and the newly launched website is queer filmmaker and activist Jim Hubbard, who directed the 2012 film United in Anger, A History of ACT UP, documenting various ACT UP campaigns, which also draws heavily from the Oral History Project interviews. Jim co-produced that film with lesbian author and activist Sarah Schulman. Welcome to Out FM, Jim Hubbard. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here and talking to you about, about the ACT UP Oral History project in the new website. All right. Well, uh, before we get into that uh, website, why don't you just give us a capsule history of your own pioneering work over the years in queer filmmaking? Oh, got a cap capsule history. Well, I started filming the, the well, what was then called the gay movement um, in 1979, um, before the first March on Washington. And um, I've been, you know, filming queer events and my que queer friends ever since. Um, and um, I especially did a lot of uh, work around demonstrations um, because they're, you know, they're very, um, they're very photogenic. And um, also in the very beginning, it was, it was much more difficult to film queer people in private. Because, because of a thing called the closet, which we don't worry about so much anymore, that um, you know people are much more open about their sexuality and their their gender, and in a way that wasn't true then. And so, but so demonstrations were a way to film people people I loved and people I admired um, in a in a way that wasn't. Um, wasn't threatening and allowed them to be them, their, themselves. Jim, you've had a website with some of the interviews with longtime AIDS activists for many years. How do you uh, assess its reach and effectiveness? And can you talk about how this new website 
uh, came to be and why you relaunched it. The old website had clips from each of, each of the interviews. Um, and it, it began, we, the first website um, debuted in November 2003. And there were real limits to the technology. And so I wanted to create a new website for quite a while. And there have been, you know, there were issues about funding and, and there's a tremendous amount of work that um, was involved before it would be possible to, to show all the interviews in their entirety, because um, that's 187 um, files that range from an hour to four hours long. And uh, so about 350 hours of video, plus all the 187 clips, plus over 100 hours of AIDS activist video. So, you know, it's, there's a tremendous amount of work that's involved. In fact, and it's all on Vimeo and Vimeo has a limit. You're only allowed 20 gigabytes um, a week, but I found a way around it. Um, but even so, it took over a year just to upload all, all the video. Jim, um, one of the features on the new website, which is actuporalhistory.org, um, that, that I really like especially are the one to four minute clips from each of the 187 interviews. And these were carefully chosen by yourself, Jim Hubbard, and also ACT UP videographer, James Wensey, um, and each one previewing one or more topics discussed by that activist. And we're now going to play a few of those clips. Um, and the first one, is by Dr. Elias Guerrero, a Latino ACT UP member who talks in this excerpt about how AIDS remains a political struggle. I think the issue was to try to raise the consciousness of, uh, of the organization that we needed, the, that ACT UP needed to address Latino issues within the context of this struggle. Uh, and I think that was the understanding that we got it, and we knew that there were other people in, in ACT UP that got it, that this, f f well, for me anyway, that AIDS is and was and will always remain a political struggle. You know, it, it, yes, it's about biology, and yes, it's about drugs, but it, it, to me, it's as I saw what happened to, uh, what, I, what I remember reading and experiencing uh, about Lorca's passing, that that was a political act. His demise was a political, and it was calculated. Uh, just as as this crisis was being drawn out, for whatever political reasons, that this it was and remains a political struggle. Uh, and I think that the 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 focus of the Latino caucus, at least as I recall it, was to try to maintain that consciousness within the rest of the organization. And that was Dr. Elias Guerrero, a member of the ACT UP uh, Latina Latino Caucus, uh, speaking for the ACT UP Oral History Project or speaking to the ACT UP Oral History Project in 2004. Closer to like 94. He is treated real badly. We took him, he was, was a, it? a friend of mine, his name is Robert, um, Robert Richardson. We took him to St. Vincent's. He was a patient at St. Vincent's. He used to use the clinic there. They literally let him, they, they let him die at St. Vincent's in the emergency room. Um, he had Medicaid, and I think this was one of the problems. I think if he had insurance, he would have got treated a whole lot better. But we were in the emergency room with him. Um, they literally, like, he was like choking on mucus. And um, they really took their time to do tests. I was there with Lee Chow. We were protesting, they, they threw us out of the emergency room. You know, um, they were threatening not to let us get back in. He died in St. Vincent's emergency room and he died from neglect. I mean, it, it could have been a whole situation. I think if he had insurance and he was somewhere else, I think he might be alive today. Act Up um, did a demonstration at the hospital. And after that, I think emergency room policies, because they made him wait and wait in the emergency room before they even seen him. When he got to the hospital, he was at the point where he had stopped talking, he couldn't walk, he couldn't stand up. Um, I don't know if he was even, we were talking to him, we didn't know if he was like understanding what we were saying anymore. 
They still made him wait like an hour before they even took him in and did his vital signs. And I had to get a wheelchair for him. They took their time with everything they did. But ACT UP had a demonstration at the hospital. They did meetings. And they, I went to the hospital with somebody else after that. They did change their emergency room policies because of ACT UP, because of that situation. Um, the triage procedures are much quicker now. Um, people with AIDS are taken right away if they're in like really bad condition like that. Triage is only up to, if they're not supposed to wait more than 20 minutes before they take them in. And I think ACT UP was changed that. And that was Sharon Tramatola talking about the demonstration that took place outside of St. Vincent's Hospital to try to get medical care for one of our members. In the next clip, ACT UP activist and one of several attorneys for the group, Jill Harris, describes how a group of AIDS activists in 1990 began openly distributing needles in the streets of Manhattan to challenge a law prohibiting dispensing needles without a prescription. By that time, ample research already showed that injection drug users would would, would use clean needles if they were available and that their use would reduce the spread of HIV. Well, the needle exchange case was a different thing completely. The needle exchange case was um, a necessity defense. So we weren't saying, you know, we did this, we sat down on the street because we needed to call attention to the fact that, you know, the government is not doing what they're supposed to do on AIDS. We actually were doing something that needed to be done that the government should be doing but wasn't doing. And we were doing it because we had to save lives because we were in an emergency. And so it was just a whole different thing conceptually. You know, we were, we were just sort of doing the right thing. And we, uh, you know, we should not only not be punished for it, but we should be able to keep doing it. In fact, the government should do it. So it was, um, it was a totally different kind of a trial and it had the, had the um, potential to sort of change government policy on needle exchange, and in fact it did. And indeed, uh, AIDS uh, or New York State policy did change shortly after that to um, allow needle exchanges to operate legally um, and ultimately was part of a, a long process nationwide that took many years to really reach the whole country um, in which uh, universal or, or very frequent needle, uh, clean needle programs became uh, available to reduce the spread of a variety of viral infections. And again, that was ACT UP uh, activist and attorney, Jill Harris. The actuporalhistory.org website contains a wealth of detailed interviews. How do you see the website being used, Jim Hubbard, uh, particularly in conjunction with Sarah Schulman's new book, uh, Let the Record Show, A Political History of ACT UP New York? Well, we hope it will be used in several different ways. I mean, one is certainly that he, here's the history, here's this um, com complex history of an activist um, group um, and a movement. And it, you know, there isn't that sort of, you know, um, primary historical documents that are available, readily available on the internet for, for lots of people. And, and it could be used by students, um, you know, to write term papers or make films for their classes. Um, it certainly can be used by uh, teachers and professors to, sh to show to their classes what really happened during the AIDS crisis. Um, because I don't think people, people don't know. They, they, you know, all this stuff has been normalized and people think that Oh, you know, America and all its um, wonderfulness and um, help people with with AIDS, and they don't know that the government literally fought against people with AIDS and and let people die and murdered people in in many instances, and that the mainstream media was not covering this issue, um, and the pharmaceutical industry had to be forced to, to come up with those drugs, even though they've made trillions of dollars on them since then. So, so there's that, but it is also a blueprint for effective grassroots political action. And I hope that young um, grassroots um, political people will take the lessons of ACT UP and apply them to the concerns of, 
of today and the future. And how about uh, documentarians and scholars? Um, do they have to get permission to use the website in publications or documentaries? Um, yeah, it's a little more complicated there. Um, uh, yes, we're, um, we're asking, you know, for the interviews themselves, we ask that they um, get permission. One of the, one of the issues is trying is to a certain extent trying to control, um, not not control, but but in make sure that they're not used in some way that's contrary to the um, uh, political ideals of, of ACT UP. Um, you know, that they're not used for commercial purposes, for instance. I mean, I don't want them used to sell drugs or, you know, to promote sneakers. Um, so there's that. Um, the, the, the activist footage is even more complicated because it's made by, that footage was made by collectives and in other in individuals. And so you have to know whom to ask to get permission. And so the only way to do that is, is to, to write me. And there's, there's a contact form on the website so that if people want to use it, they can, they can contact me. Fantastic. In the next clip, we hear ACT UP member Esther Kaplan, who incidentally is a former producer here at WBAI, uh, discussing organizing mass civil disobedience in 1995, which shut down four major um, New York City traffic bottlenecks, including two tunnels and two bridges. And this clip reveals how ACT UP was building alliances with anti-police brutality groups, anti-racist groups, and also student organizers throughout the city. And this was during Giuliani's time. Mayor Giuliani. As bad as Koch was, Giuliani was really a monster and um, came into, into office just going after the weak, I mean, like his campaign against squeegee men that he started, you know, his mayoralty with was just outrageous. Like really, you're, that's, that's who you, the mayor of the city of New York is gonna go after. Some guys on the corner trying to clean some windshields for pocket change. Um, Wow. But um, so there were massive budget cuts. There was just a, like harsh rhetoric emanating from the mayor's office. But what was happening is he was, it was such a like, you know, the, the victims were, were everywhere. And so like every, it's like every mobilized constituency in the city, it was like every day on the steps of city hall. It was like one day it was the soup kitchens and the next day it was the, you know, CUNY students and the next day it was ACT UP and, you know, everyone was like trying to fight back the damage in these brutal um, budget cuts and um, this, these quality of life crackdowns and so on and it, it just started feeling ridiculous. Like if one person, one, if one group, like if ACT UP won its budget line, someone else was going to lose theirs and it felt really awful actually for a while. And um, so um, at the time I was um, getting involved in, in police brutality work more broadly. And, and, um, and uh, so this woman at Coalition for the Homeless who'd been involved in the legal challenge around Haiti Lisa Dugard and I approached Richie Perez, who was the head of the um, Committee Against Police Brutality at the time, and we basically said, like, why don't we try it? Let's try to do a massive civil disobedience. Let's get as many of these constituencies as possible together and see if we can take on Giuliani in a united front way. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny. It was very, like, I, th I think of it as, like, very similar to a lot of the anti-globalization protests and stuff that happened afterward, but at the time it felt pretty unusual. ACT UP was the only group really doing civil disobedience at that time. It was kind of exotic um, for other organizations. So we actually, ACT UP ended up doing the CD training for all the other groups because we were the only ones that had the recent experience of doing it. Um, but we had like secret meetings for months, you know, trying to keep the NYPD from finding out. and. 
got like a bunch of different constituencies and organizations involved and finally kind of brought it to the ACT UP floor um, and, and got approval for it. But it was, in the, in the end, it wasn't as big as we'd hoped, but we had, um, we shut down on a single day four bridges and tunnels coming in and out of Manhattan. Um, and it was CUNY students who were protesting um, these really draconian cuts to, and tuition hikes at CUNY. It was um, police brutality activists protesting the police violence. It was homeless activists protesting the crackdown of homeless people. And it was AIDS activists protesting these drastic cuts to AIDS programs and to public hospitals. Um, and I think it was the Holland Tunnel and the Queens Midtown Tunnel and the Manhattan and Brooklyn bridges um, during rush hour one morning. And there were, with each civil disobedience action, there's also a public protest um, in conjunction with uh, a non um, civil disobedience action with each one. And, you know, we worked really hard. Each, each group got to have their own flyer, but on the reverse, we had a joint statement that was really trying to put forward this kind of politics of solidarity and I mean it was really a pretty beautiful thing I have to say. Which tunnel were you at? Um, I was at Midtown Tunnel. And that was the voice of ACT UP member Esther Kaplan being interviewed by Sarah Shulman um, who coordinated the ACT UP Oral History Project together with our guest um, Jim Hubbard. Um, and Jim has now um, updated the website and massively expanded it to include the full videos of all the 187 uh, participants in ACT UP wh whom they interviewed. And let me ask you, Jim, uh, looking at the big picture of ACT UP's evolution, um, can you talk about the, the transformation that proceeded gradually over the period of the late 80s to the early 90s from a, a fairly narrow single issue group focused on um, demanding FDA approval or, or faster track to look at the possibly promising drugs to being um, a multi-issue group that really had what we would now call an intersectional analysis of the problem, the, the pandemic of that era of AIDS. Bob, I think you would be better to answer that question than I would. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, you know, I in the you know, of course, in the beginning, it's sort of it, I think even in the beginning, it's a reductionist view of ACT UP to say that it was all about drugs into bodies. But but that was the main focus. And in the meetings, you know, I remember one of the phrases that got repeated over and over again. When, when people would get up to speak was, what's that got to do with AIDS? And um, so there was an evolution in, within the group about trying to figure out what that has to do with AIDS. And you know, um, for a rich person or even a middle-class person with a steady job, homelessness is not an AIDS issue, but if, but if you're homeless and and have HIV, or you're you know you can you can only um, hold on to your apartment, you know, with great struggle, then homelessness is is about AIDS. And so um, and then there are other things where where it's not only about gay white men. There are issues about people of color and women and you know, that, that four year long fight, the struggle to change the definition of AIDS, because in the beginning, the, the definition of AIDS and, and all the services, you know, the, the, the social services and the, the social security money, all, all that stemmed from the definition of AIDS. And if it didn't, uh, you know, until the change, it didn't have diseases that women were getting and IV drug users were getting. And so those people were, you know, they had HIV, but they didn't have the diagnosis and they didn't receive the care and, and the support that they needed to stay alive. And so that change saved 
probably hundreds of thousands of lives across this country, millions of lives across the world, because every, every other country in the world was using the CDC definition of, of AIDS. And in our final clip in part one of this interview with Jim Hubbard of the ACT UP Oral History Project, we hear an anecdote of activist Jamie Leo, in which he describes how he confronted a Catholic Cardinal's pitifully paltry response to the AIDS crisis. Columbia University had just come forward with the numbers that there were 12,000 homeless people with AIDS in the city. And so you can imagine our response when we all learned that the Cardinal Cook Center, the former flower hospital on Fifth Avenue, was opening a room with seven new AIDS beds. And it was going to be a high profile event. They were gonna start with a service and then we were gonna open up to the auditorium and the mayor was gonna be there and Cardinal Connor was gonna be, I mean, just the whole circus was there. I was gonna go as the, the character name, you've heard this from other activists too, but my pen name was Father Octum Torres. That was the character's name. And so Torres was gonna go um, and we were going to be there for the opening of the chapel. So we got there to the opening of the chapel, and because we're in the right outfit, we we're just escorted in. So now I'm supposed to, in my priest garb, I'm supposed to go next. So, I'll, you know, for my own fears of, of getting it wrong, I was just scribing and scribing and scribing. I just kept writing and writing and writing what I was going to say. Even though we knew my soundbite, my soundbite was going to be the number of beds. That's what I was going to, it was about get the number of beds, you know. And so I got up at the moment, and when Cardinal Connor went on, I just remember, if you remember Fellini's Roma, when the cameras come on the Vatican show at the end, and all the lights are, all the camera lights are on so bright that the, the papal fashions all just blur to a bright blossomed white. It was like that. And I remember just, I remember rising and standing, and as I stood, I remember just seeing this wall of white lights as all these fucking cameras turned to me and all I could see was that face of Cardinal Connor glaring at me. And I started, and you know, Catholic in recovery, but I started with a prayer. And I said, um, Heavenly Father, let us pray that, that we will use love and not cruelty to guide us here today. and." that we will be true to family values and that may we please find in our hearts to exclude, not include. Well, what happened is silence came over the room because you don't interrupt a prayer in a Catholic get-together. And I said something about, you know, and, and may people who would take advantage of this epidemic for their own benefit, may they find compassion and may they please, and, 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 and in a city of 12,000 homeless people, may may the people that open a hospital with 10 beds realize that they are not doing something great to help people or something to that effect. Well, needless to say, it was the lead news story that night. That sound bite got it. It nailed it. But at that moment, I felt the arm. I, was, I couldn't believe how long they went on. I mean, it went on too long. And no one's hissing. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get beaten to a pulp. And this great big cop grabs me and, he, and, I, and I come away and I realize that how he's holding me is not the NBC guys. He's like holding me and escorting me. The minute he gets me out, and of course I am wimping out of my wits, I'm shaking like a leaf. And the second I get out, this cop says, oh father, now we gotta sit you down and calm you down. And I was like, what? He goes, no, 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 Father, please. He goes, let me get you a glass of water, but I can't let you go back in there. And it was like the sweet Irish policeman, you know? And so I didn't know what to do, and I'm like, oh my God, this is what's going on here. And I was like, I have my ID, sir, if you need to. He goes, oh, I'm not arresting you. You spoke your piece. And I was just like, huh, da, 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 you know? So he sits me down, and then he walks over, and he brings me a glass of water, and he goes, he goes, oh, you know, Father. And I said, I said, I, you know, I just know I'm, I said, I just, I had to say these things. He goes, oh, Father. You think those two up on the stage, you think they know what's going on in this city? They don't know what's going on. They've never seen a hospital ward. You know, whatever. So it's like the, the only weird part of the story was like when the poor sweet man took me to the front door of the hospital and opened the door and 500 activists started cheering. And that was activist Jamie Leo of ACT UP discussing an attention-grabbing guerrilla theater intervention that he did to highlight the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church.
You know, I want to say that, you know, the clips that you've chosen, not, not only is there, you know, incredible range of issues. So there's Latino issues, IV drug issues, um, the, the coalition with other organizations, the Catholic Church, um, hospice, but, but also the range of, of ACT UP's tactics and strategies. And, the, and that's what was always so important and great about ACT UP is that the people in ACT UP figured out, okay, what's gonna make the most impact and let's do that. And not, they didn't just stick to doing the same thing over and over again. Indeed, and that was uh, one of the joys of ACT UP is the unleashing of creativity. Absolutely. And um, it's, it's one of many reasons that John and I both were so proud to and so moved by our time in ACT UP and, ACT, and John is still a member of ACT UP even to this day. Um, so we are going to have to wrap up uh, this part of the interview. This is part one of a two part interview with Jim Hubbard, the creator of the website actuphoralhistory.org. And we want to encourage our listeners to spend some serious time on this site. You'll, you'll be richly rewarded if you do, uh, watching the videos and reading the texts of um, many of the important documents of ACT UP's history and the important voices that, that made it such a, um, a powerful force in New York City politics and in really as part of the national movement of ACT UP's and other aligned groups, uh, part of national politics and policy that really transformed the country's response to the AIDS pandemic. So um, that's, that's it for uh, this segment. Tune in a week from now, uh, 8 p.m. on Out FM for part two of our interview with Jim Hubbard and more clips from the video shown on the website actuporalhistory.org. And with John Riley, I'm Bob Letterer for Out FM.